when a believer strengthens that and is consistent in that, it then bears fruit with something known as shuhud or mushahada, which is spiritual witnessing. Then a person's insight becomes uh, uh, clarified and open so that they begin to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, actions and they see the manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all that surrounds them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in those things. Hasha. There is nothing like him. He is not within his creation, subhana, but rather a person starts to see that Allah is providing for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sustaining them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to them than their carotid artery and so on and so forth. And this is all taken from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam when he was asked by Sayyidina Jibreel in the famous hadith Jibreel, uh, الإحسان, what is Ihsan? What is Ihsan, which is the foundation for the science, which is the name in Hadith Jibreel related to the goal and the result of Tasawwuf? The Prophet وسلم, said, Al Ihsan and Ta'bud Allah ka annaka tara. Ihsan is that you worship Allah as though you see Him. And if you do not see him, he nevertheless sees you. So these are that second stage, knowing that he sees us is muraqaba. And if we can attain that higher level and we strive to attain that higher level of worshiping him as though we see him, that is known as mushahada. So these are the two verses that the author begins this book with. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ ما يكون من نجوى ثلاثة إلا هو رابعهم ولا خمسة إلا هو سادسهم ولا أدنى من ذلك ولا أكثر إلا هو معهم أينما كانوا Then the author says, I bear witness that there is no God except Allah alone without partner. And then he quotes another verse of the Quran. There is no secret conversation between three people except that he is the fourth, nor between five except that he is the sixth nor between less or more than that, without him being with them. Now, On the day of resurrection, he will show them what they have done. Allah truly has full knowledge of everything. So this is another verse of the Quran, the testifying the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Allah has knowledge of all things. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala witnesses and watches over us in every situation. And then from there, the author then moves on to the next part of the shahada. And I bear witness that our master, our Sayyid, our prophet, and the coolness of our eyes, our heart's joy, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is his servant and messenger. He sent him with guidance and the religion of truth to give it ascendancy over all other religions, however much the polytheists may hate this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the exalted, addressed him by saying, O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of good news and warning, as one who calls people to Allah by his leave and as a light-giving lamp. Give the believers the good news that great bounty awaits them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is really beautiful. After the author really uh, sets the foundation for the understanding of everything that's to come in the book. And this is known as the, uh, uh, the opening oftentimes when authors will begin their books. In the introductory praise, they will allude to the topic that they're going to cover. So here, the topic is the heart's awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actualizing servitude. So after bearing witness uh, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the second half of the shahada is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, Allah's greatest beloved, his most noble prophet and messenger, the imam of the prophets and messengers, Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final prophet and messenger, the second half of the shahada. And that 
the way that we attain all of the traits that we're going to study and the way that we actualize our servitude is by following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam and that he is the exemplar, he is the role model, he is the one who realized and attained all of these qualities to the most perfect extent and manifested them in the most perfect of ways as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, chose him and created him and honored him and fashioned him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us we have sent, tells us that he sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a witness a bearer of good news and a warning as one who calls people to Allah and as a light giving lamp as a siraj and munira, what does a lamp do? A lamp guides us through the darkness. It gives us direction. It gives us warmth in the cold. It is a means of multiple benefits. And that following the Prophet ﷺ, especially in times of uncertainty, and especially in times of uh, where really we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, we really feel in these days that our habits and our routines have all really been overturned. But in actuality, it's an opportunity for us to reconnect with Allah's guidance and with the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, and to take him as an imam, to take him as the leader who guides us through the darkness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's good pleasure and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nearness. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also addressed him saying, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon. Noon, the letter noon, by the pen and by all they write. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. You are not by your Lord's grace a madman. Wa inna laka la ajran ghayra mamnoon. And you will have a never ending reward addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And you are truly upon a magnificent character. Addressing the Prophet wasallam, And then this also shows us that the ten traits of the people of Tasawwuf, the traits of the, the righteous, the traits of the people who take this path of أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ The path of worshipping Allah as though you see Him, that all of those qualities and all of those traits stem from the character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And then the author continues to share verses of the Quran indicating the blessing that Allah has given us in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and in his blessed example. And it's important for us to understand because oftentimes people think that the sunnah is just a to-do list of things that we need to do. Or sometimes people look at it only through the lens of reward. And that's very important. It's not to uh, disregard that or underestimate that. But really the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam is the path to receiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows his love upon a servant, then there is no greater blessing that can ever be described. In a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, says, إِذَا أَحَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا نَادَ جِبْرِيلٍ يَا جِبْرِيلٍ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانًا فَأَحِبَّ That when Allah loves a servant, when Allah bestows his love upon a servant, he calls out to Jibreel alayhi salam the greatest of all the angels, the most noble and preeminent among all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's noble angels brought near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him and says, Oh Jibreel, I love so-and-so, so love them. And this is beautiful. Think about that. Imagine for a moment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his speech that is pre-eternal, in his speech that is uncreated, that is part of his attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is unlike the speech of any created being, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your name. 
and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, Jibreel, I love, and imagine your name for a moment. Imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that fill in the blank, he says your name. Ya Jibreel, O oh, Jibreel, I love so and so. Imagine the feeling, imagine the honor, imagine the esteem, imagine the, the fulfillment that you will get from that. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds. You know, sometimes people are happy if a famous person just knows their name. They know who I am. Oh, they remember me. You feel kind of honored by that. And then if they, that person mentions them, how is so-and-so doing? It's an added degree of honor. But if that person that they love and that is so well known says, I love that person. Most people, if they're really infatuated with that famous person, they might even pass out. And that's another created being who eats and sleeps and has needs just like anyone else. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that about one of his servants. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that honor. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include us in that. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. The sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the key to that door is the path to Allah's love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say, if you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Then say to them, O oh, Prophet Muhammad, you are the one that is saying that. If you love Allah, then follow me, i.e. the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what is the result when you follow the Prophet? يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ Allah will love you and he will forgive you your sins. So the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and following his path is the key to being given love from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after Allah calls to Jibreel and says that, Jibreel then goes to all of the angels and those who reside in the heavenly realm and calls out to them and says, verily Allah loves so-and-so the name of that person, so love them, so love him or love her. And then that person will be loved by the, uh, those who reside in the heavenly realm. And then the hadith says, ثُمَّ And then that person will have acceptance in the earth. So following the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah says, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah has been truly gracious. He has truly favored the believers. He has been so kind to the believers in what? In sending them a messenger from among their own. This messenger that he has sent the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he recites his revelations to them. He purifies them. And this is what we're talking about, this path of tazkiyah, and that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the imam. He is the exemplar. He is the preeminent. He is the example in this path of purification and to teach them the scripture and wisdom. And before that, they were clearly astray. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفَ الرَّحِيمِ A messenger has come to you from among yourselves. Your suffering distresses him. He is deeply concerned for you and full of kindness and mercy towards the believers. This is our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam that he has so much concern for his ummah that any difficulty that a member of his ummah or groups among his ummah go through, that suffering distresses him. He bears that burden, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is deeply concerned for you. The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has more concern for us than our own fathers and mothers, our own parents and loved ones. That on the day of resurrection, when everyone is uh, uh, fleeing from one another and everyone is saying, nafsi, nafsi, I only care about myself, myself, 
on the day when a person will run away from his own brother and his mother and father and his wife his spouse and his children every person on that day will have a, a matter that uh, makes them not care about anyone else the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa will say ummati ummati when everyone is in that state he will be concerned about you and i and members of his ummah sallallahu alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and allah sent him only as a mercy to the world so the author here in this introduction and i pray that inshallah it's clear and understood that he begins with the verses related to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mushahada and muraqaba witnessing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing and realizing his watching over us jalla jalalu glorious is his majesty and then from there testifying uh, to allah's oneness testifying to his sending of the messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam and that following his path is the path of tazkiyah so already here from the very beginning the author is rooting everything that we're talking about in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam and anything that contradicts the book and anything that contradicts the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam you can wash your hands of it and even if people claim that it brings them realization we want nothing to do with it all good is found in following the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam whose character was the Quran now and then the author sends salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, send your most graceful prayers and purest peace upon your servant and beloved, our master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the guide to your straight path, as Allah says in the Quran. And upon his folk and people of the house, his Ahlul Bayt, those that are unified with the Quran, those that are uh, uh, in allegiance to the Quran, who will not separate from it, until they reach him at the basin, the Hawd, on the day of resurrection, as mentioned in a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَن يَتَفَرِّقَ حَتَّى يَرِدَ عَلَيَّ الْحَوْد Now, uh, and upon his companions. So this is the way of the people of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the people of the majority of the Ummah. The understanding has always been a special love and honor for the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as his companions Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam because both the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions their honor stems from their connection to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon his companions the migrants and helpers the Muhajireen and Ansar the people of precedence, virtue, and honor, and upon those who follow them with excellence, with ihsan, and upon his fathers and brothers from the prophets and messengers, their families and companions, the elect angels, and all of Allah's righteous servants, ameen, to proceed. So then the author now is going to uh, speak of the purpose of composing and writing this book. This is a sufficient, clear, and concise exposition of the reality of Sufism, tasawwuf, and the traits of the people of the spiritual path. By Allah's will, it will benefit those who sincerely seek clarification and guidance, as well as whomever else Allah wills from among his servants. May Allah extend its benefit for the author, reader, scribe, listener, and the entire ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. After this introduction uh, and really setting the tone and the understanding for this entire book, the next section that the author covers is the definition of tasawwuf. Now this is really important because the ulama of Islam, whenever they were teaching any particular science, whether it's fiqh or aqidah or usul, or hadith or otherwise, tafsir and so forth, they were really careful about defining terms. Why? 
because people can use terms uh, haphazardly. I can say a word that means one thing to me and means something else to you. And then if that's the case, we're actually go not going to understand each other or maybe misunderstand one another. Or a person might misuse a word and then someone would ask, what do you mean by that particular term or that particular word? And especially as it relates to tasawwuf and Sufism, it's extremely important that we come back to the usul. We come back to the foundational principles and the basics, for lack of a better word, and understand it clearly. Because people might have attached a lot of different understandings, or they might have a lot of hang-ups about what this really means. And anything that exceeds or contradicts uh, these meanings is not of tasawwuf, uh, and that's not what we're talking about. So then the author says, what is at tasawwuf? What is Sufism? Sufism is to act with excellence. Husnul amal. It is to act with excellence. That when we pray, when we fast, when we engage in any of the acts of ibadah or any of the acts with a righteous intention, that bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we aspire to do so with excellence, with ihsan. And to embody the qualities pursuant with the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-haqq. So it is to take on the qualities that are aligned with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to, and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, dhawqan wa tahaqqan. What does that mean? Experientially and with realization. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to be mindful of him and to know with realization, to experience that he is with us wherever we are. That's something that every believer believes in. But how many people feel it, they worship Allah as though they are seeing him. How many people are so aware of that, that they have a state or they are constantly in a state where whatever they would do in public is the same thing that they would do in private, even if no one is there, due to their, the degree of their awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is dhawqan wa tahaqqan, experientially and with realization that a person uh, uh, tastes that nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also realized in the true meanings of the Quran and the Sunnah related to those qualities. So that's one definition that the author gives us. So then he says, it is also to ascend from ilm al-yaqeen to uh, ilm al-yaqeen, which is the knowledge of certainty to ayn al yaqeen the witnessing of certainty, to haqq al yaqeen which is the reality of certainty or certitude. What does that mean? The ulama, they talk about, and these are terms that are taken from the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about ilm al yaqeen and ayn al yaqeen and haqq al yaqeen The knowledge of certainty, the witnessing with certitude, and the reality of certitude. That what this means is, the ulama, they say that there are different degrees of certitude. So for example, if it's raining outside, or the weather is, uh, you know, very windy and rainy, but you're in a room where you can't see what's going on outside, and someone comes in, and they're trustworthy, and they say, oh, it's raining outside, it's so windy and raining, if someone else then asks you and says, what's the weather like outside? You say, oh, apparently it's raining. Someone I trust has informed me that it's raining outside and it's very windy. So make sure when you go outside that you take an umbrella. Let's say you call someone at home, even if you haven't seen it yourself. Then you go to the window and you look out the window and you see that it's wet and it's raining. You now have gone from the knowledge of certainty, something that you believe to be true, to a higher degree of certitude. Now you see it with your own eyes. So, oh no, I can see that it's raining. If someone comes to you now and says, it's not raining, you wouldn't be shaken by that lie 
And you say, no, no, I've seen it with my own eyes, it's raining. And then when you go outside and you start getting wet and you feel the wind hitting against you, now you have experienced the thing that you had knowledge of prior to. Now you're experiencing it for yourself. So now there's no more room for doubt. That is haqqul yaqeen, the reality of certitude. Now, if someone comes and says, no, 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 it's not raining. You say, I'm wet. I felt the rain on my skin. I felt the wind uh, pushing me. No one can shake that degree of certitude. And these are the degrees of Iman. So Ihsan is ascending from that initial stage of Ilm al yaqeen up into a degree of Ayn al yaqeen the witnessing of certitude, where you are witnessing the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the realities of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the way to ascend to the degree of the reality of certainty or the reality of certitude that can never be shaken and is like a firm mountain. So that is what tasawwuf is about, is ascending in those degrees. Another definition the author gives us is, it is to traverse the ladder of Islam and Iman, these degrees of this religion, until one attains the ranks of nearness to Allah and elect gnosis, ma'rifah khasa, and complete love from Allah and for Allah. So this is another definition, and this is a definition that gives us the path and the result of tasawwuf, that it is to traverse the ladder of Islam and Iman, reaching to the degree of Ihsan until one attains ma'rifa khasa, that one attains elect gnosis, experiential knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's attributes and his actions and his sifat and his that subhanahu wa ta'ala and complete love from Allah and for Allah, and that the servant is granted that love from Allah. And then that servant is stable and firmly rooted in the station of loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not loving anything to the degree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is loved and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and all of those things that are honored by Allah. So that's another definition. The last definition that he, uh, the author offers here is once again, a very practical definition. Someone says, okay, how do I realize all of the previous definitions that were mentioned? It is to have excellence in following our master, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa husulu thamaratihi min mahabbatillahi azza wa jal. And to attain the fruits of that by the way of receiving love or having love of Allah, the glorious and majestic. So it is following the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with excellence until one becomes beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the path of ihsan. And that is what the science of tasawwuf is dedicated to. Sufism is dedicated to excellence and following the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inwardly and outwardly until attaining the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last thing we'll focus on now is the definition of the Sufi. The definition of what is a Sufi. And unfortunately, this word has been misused both by those who try to criticize it and by those who love and respect the path of tasawwuf. It's been misused. That is a reality. Some people just say, yeah, I'm Sufi, I'm Sufi, or he's Sufi, or she's Sufi. And the reality is that this is a very noble term. This is a very high rank. And uh, it is not something easy to claim. Uh, and it is not something that we take lightly. And on the other hand, you have people who say, oh, he's a Sufi or she's a Sufi and try to say it in a derogatory way. <laughs> Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah in his book, Kitab al-Adhkar, when he refers to some of his shuyukh and some of the people that he learned from, he will say that this Shaykh so-and-so 
was a zahid, was someone detached from the dunya, was someone of a great degree of taqwa, and was a Sufi. And he'll refer to his shiuch and give the highest honorific title to them by uh, designating them and calling them Sufis. So this is a very high and noble rank. And it's only really in recent times that there has been such a confusion uh, and people have attacked it in such a way. So what is the Sufi? The author says, whoever reaps the fruits of excellence, whoever attains the fruits of ihsan in action and takes on the qualities that are in accordance with Allah's message and that of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with ex experientially and with realization, then this is the Sufi. The person who has attained all of the things that we spoke about in the definition before, the person who has achieved that is the Sufi. That is uh, the person who is really the Sufi. And then there are people along that path, we'll talk about them uh, shortly. The author continues, Sayyid al-Habib Umar bin Hafil, he says, one is not called a Sufi except after they have reached the station of Aynul Yaqeen, the witnessing of certitude. So uh, when a person goes from Ilmul Yaqeen to Aynul Yaqeen, that they have made progress in their Yaqeen, in their, the strength of their certitude in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that is when this term can actually be applied to them. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Ihsan an ta'bud Allah ka annaka tarah, fa illam takun tarahu fa innahu yaraq. Spiritual excellence, Ihsan, is to worship Allah as though you see him. And if you do not see him, then he sees you. So this relates to Aynul Yaqeen, the witnessing of certitude. The author continues and says, as for someone who is loyal to them and exerts himself in following their way, but has not attained the station of Aynul Yaqeen, then this person is a mutasawwif, but not a Sufi. Someone who loves the people of Allah, loves the people who have these traits that we're going to cover of knowledge of the book and the sunnah, of humility, of sincerity, of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of people who reconcile and bring people together and people who try to uh, remove envy from the hearts, people who are not involved in argumentation and arrogance and so forth. Whoever loves them and exerts himself or herself in following their way, but has not really attained that degree of realization of being at a stage of Aynul Yaqeen, the witnessing of cert certain uh, cert certitude, this person is a mutasawwif, is Sufi-like, is trying to be like the true people of tasawwuf, but is not a Sufi, is not to be called a Sufi. So the reality is for many people, even this degree is honorable right, is honorable. So whoever uh, is loyal to them and exerts themselves in that path is trying to purify their heart, is trying to be in a state where they worship Allah as though they are seeing him, trying to attain that love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that his love and the love of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what he has called us to is so firmly established in the heart that nothing can overcome it. Whoever is along that path is a mutasawwif. Then the author says, whoever is loyal to them but does not fully exert himself in following their path, then this person is one who attempts to resemble them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Man fahuwa minhum. Whoever attempts to resemble a people is of them. So here the author is saying that even that degree of loving them and trying to take on some of what they have is a form of goodness in and of itself. In his book, Al-Kibrit Al-Ahmar, Red Sulfur, Imam Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr al aidarus says, the Sufi, what is, this is another definition of the Sufi. Who is the Sufi? Is the traveler on the spiritual path who has arrived. Someone who has attained Aynul Yaqeen and Haqq Al-Yaqeen. 
And we see this in the examples of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that many of them would even witness things from the unseen, such as seeing angels and so forth, that they had such a degree of certitude that it was not shaken by the great difficulties that they faced radiallahu anhum. So someone who attains these high degrees of certitude is the Sufi. The one resembling them is someone, uh, the one resembling them is someone who holds on to the path and loves them. The one resembling those who resemble them is someone who believes in their path and loves them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, a person is with whomever he loves. Whoever loves a people is of them. It is transmitted in an authentic hadith. A person is with whomever he loves. So here the author has established for us uh, the understanding rooted in shuhud and muraqaba, rooted in the state of the heart being purified to such a degree that you worship Allah as though you are seeing him and that you witness him and that you know of his awareness of you and that he is closer to you than your carotid artery and that you are never alone except that he is with you and that he uh, sees what is in your innermost heart and secret that no one else can see. And that when you develop that, then uh, you ascend in the degrees of witnessing. And the way to achieve that is following in the footsteps of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam with Ihsan, with the highest degree of excellence. And that is what the science of Tasawwuf and the definition of Tasawwuf is. And uh, uh, the Sufi is someone who is advanced and has been accomplished uh, in doing so. And really what that is, is someone who is uh, at a high degree of ihsan. So it's not something to be taken lightly and it's not a word to be just used haphazardly. It's a very noble term, but it is also for uh, those who have accomplished a lot on the spiritual path. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to beautify us with all of the traits of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that as we continue to study this book together and to attempt to internalize and follow uh, these qualities and these traits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to ascend in the degrees of nearness and that he grants us a gaze of his mercy and transforms our states uh, into the best of states. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Tibb al-qulubi wa dawaiha wa aafiyat al-abdani wa shifaiha wa nur al-absari wa diyaiha wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Inshallah for the next 10-15 minutes or so, uh, we'll uh, answer some questions. So if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to type them out and we'll try our best to cover them all. Bi-idhnallahi ta'ala. The first question is, why is there such confusion about Sufism? And where does the word Sufi or Sufism come from? Uh, part of the reason why there is such confusion about uh, Tasawwuf and Sufism is largely due to uh, at least two factors, at least two factors. There might be more. One is the uh, general state of confusion that many Muslim countries experienced post-colonialism, that really there was a lot that happened emotionally, intellectually, uh, spiritually, that really shook people uh, through that experience of colonialism. And there was so much done to the psyche of Muslims that really uh, confused many things. And much of that was intentional, and much of that is really uh, uh, embedded into the way that colonialism was done in Muslim countries and in other countries that are, were not Muslim-majority countries, is really to uh, divide and conquer and to put wedges between people and to make them confused about one another. Uh, so that's one factor. Another factor is that whenever people claim tasawwuf, whenever people claim to be on the spiritual path, but that that path is not rooted 
in knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, that that path is not rooted in a, a deep understanding of the religion upon sound practice of the imams of fiqh and the imams of the sharia and upon sound belief uh, and aqidah, then uh, it starts to deviate from the true path. The problem is people still claim tasawwuf. It's not tasawwuf at that point. It's not true Sufism. Just like if someone has deviant aqaid, deviant creed and deviant beliefs and tries to say, this is the aqidah, someone would say, no, but aqidah is understanding the Quran and the Sunnah and the science related to that so that we can learn it and believe in it and implement it properly that the science of fiqh is the methodology of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah so that we can pray and we can fast and we can give zakat and we can perform all of the ahkam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made an obligation upon us. So the word Sufi or tasawwuf, the ulama, they talk, they have a lot of conversation about the origins of the word. Uh, some say that it comes from suf, it comes from wool, uh, because many of the people early on in Islam, as Islam spread, and there started to be more, uh, more manifestations of uh, luxury and opulence, that many of the people who wanted to devote themselves to detaching themselves from the dunya, they would wear very simple clothes made of suf, made of wool, so those uh, scholars and those people who dedicated them, themselves to worshiping Allah with excellence, they became known as the Sufis, right? Other people say, other ulama say that it's related to Ahl al-Sufa, that the people of the bench, which were a group of the companions in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who lived in his masjid and were very detached from the world. And even outwardly, they did not uh, work and they did not uh, engage in the world of means. Some people say it stems from there. Other ulama say it stems from the word safa, uh, which is purity, and that it relates to purifying the heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The ulama say that the words uh, are not uh, in and of themselves what matters, but really defining, having clear definitions of technical terms and agreeing on those definitions and understanding them is extremely important. The next question is, so Sufi is a rank and not a sect of Islam. Uh, Sufism is a science. It's important to understand, rooted in a hadith known as Hadith Jibreel. This is a hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim and others, and it's considered one of the most uh, authoritative and authenticated a hadith, it's mutawatir, where the Prophet ﷺ was asked a list of questions by the angel Jibreel who came in the form of a man and the Sahaba witnessed this exchange and learned from this exchange, which was, what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Islam is to testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to establish the prayer, to pay the zakat, to fast the month of Ramadan and to perform the hajj for whoever is able to do so. So that became known as the five pillars of Islam and that really relates to all of the rulings the ulama say that this dimension of the religion, this particular aspect which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered and responded to relates to the ahkam, the rulings of what uh, of uh, behavior and what we do and how we act and the ways that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So prayer, the rulings related to prayer, the rulings related to purification, tahara, how much the zakat is, how to pay it and so forth. And all of that is covered in the science known as fiqh. And a master of the science of fiqh is known as a faqih, someone who is firmly rooted and understands the sharia. Uh, then the second question, what is iman? 
Rasulullah SAW said, "An tu'min billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawm al-akhir wal qadari khayrihi wa sharrih." That you believe in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, the last day and divine decree, the good and evil. So this became known as the science of aqidah, of belief and creed and theology. So those, uh, those answers that the Prophet Sallallahu they relate to everything regarding what we believe. So that became the science of aqidah. The third question, what is ihsan? أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهِ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكَ To worship Allah as though you see him. And if you do not see him, knowing that he sees you, that relates to the soul. And that relates to removing the obstacles and the veils and the rust from the heart through the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ so that one reaches that degree of awareness and certitude with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science uh, in order to achieve that and how to purify the heart and what obstacles of the nafs and of the shaitan and of the dunya and of the hawa, all of these particular pitfalls and obstacles, the science that helps us get through all of that rooted in the Quran and the sunnah, taken from the Quran and the sunnah, is known as tasawwuf or tazkiyah or ihsan. It has been known by scholars throughout uh, very early on in Islamic history as tasawwuf. And there's nothing wrong with that word, which is why we use that word and we have to uh, uh, clarify the misconception. So it's not a sect. Uh, and there are different manifestations and people will, will do different things claiming to be Sufis. Uh, and that claim, if it's accurate, it will be aligned with the Quran and Sunnah. If it's not rooted in knowledge, then that's how you uh, use that criteria. So it's not a sect of Islam. A scholar who is deeply and firmly rooted, just like a scholar of faqih, of fiqh is called a faqih, and a scholar of hadith is called a muhaddith, and a scholar of tafsir is called a mufassir, that, they, that these are titles indicating that this scholar is firmly established and realized in his particular science, uh, then a scholar of the spiritual path and the purification of the heart who has realization and experience is called a Sufi, is called a Sufi. So that's uh, uh, regarding what is Sufism and Tasawwuf. And then the last question here, is it correct adab to say the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba are Sufis or are they above that rank? Uh, more accurately, one would say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba are the exemplars in everything in religion. And that the path of tasawwuf, just like we wouldn't even necessarily say that the Sahaba are muftis, we wouldn't say that the Sahaba are mufassirin, are scholars of tafsir. Why? Because those terms really uh, were brought about in an attempt to preserve the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu and the teachings passed down among the Sahaba and by the Sahaba over time when things started to creep in that contradicted that, that uh, uh, sciences and methodologies were brought to preserve those sciences and to preserve that guidance and to preserve those teachings. So what we would say is that the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba are the greatest exemplars of the righteous of the Salihin, that they are the greatest awliya, as mentioned in the Quran, and that the path of tasawwuf and the greatest of the Sufis are those who follow in the footsteps of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So to put it that way, and Allah knows best, is more accurate. Uh, and sometimes people might say certain things to indicate that Sufism has to be taken directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that he is the greatest Sufi in the sense that he is the greatest person of Ihsan. But more accurately, it would be to say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest role model for the path of Tasawwuf and for 
uh, uh, what one attains through following in his footsteps with Ihsan. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to benefit from this uh, book. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this from us and make this effort and this time spent learning these traits and learning about this path uh, solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may he accept it from us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us purity and grant us sincerity and grant us all of these qualities في خير ولطف وعافية وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته to all of you uh, thank you for your time may Allah subhanahu wa taala accept from all of us والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته